so this is one of those portions of scripture that, that comes with kind of like this paradox. On the one hand, when I see the big picture in context, I can, I can understand the principle to some degree academically, intellectually. I can grasp it a little bit. But then when I look closely and I put it in the context of the age in which we live, the world in which we live, the realities that surround us, I'm fraught with challenges and difficulties in my, in my human heart to, to, to grasp the fullness of this. It's a paradox. It's easy on one hand, difficult on another. Get it on one hand, don't get it on the other. Makes sense on one hand, makes no sense on the other. And, and it's one of those that, that's there. Certainly Romans 13 is, is one of those unique portions that, that drive those kinds of conflicting responses. Maybe start with the big picture. That maybe I can begin to, to grasp. If I am a, a believer in Jesus and, I, and I've come to him, repentance and faith, and I realize the truth of who I was before I came to Jesus, if I realize the truth of that first section of the book of Romans, how, how sinful I am, how depraved I am, how lost I am, not how the culture likes to view itself, basically good, needing a little repair, you know, we're all wonderful people. We can get better. If I understand the truth of who I am and then the real truth of what God did to respond to the reality of my utter lostness, all of sin and come short of the glory of God, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? When I realize what God did, what Jesus did, responding to the truth, the reality of my condition, I'm less left pretty much blown away, right? We, we, we come maybe to that place where, where God in his mercy he draws us to himself and he removes the scales from our eyes and he gives us understanding and, and in the brokenness of our sin, like, like Isaiah when he saw the Lord, man, I'm a mess, I'm undone. Everything about me is exposed to the, 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 the radiance of, of your radiology, your x-ray. And man, I see what I really am, all that sin that's there. And I thank you, you did something about it. I turned from my sin and I turned to you. Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, remove all the stains. Only you can do it. Man, when we've been there and God breathes into us the breath of spiritual life, it's like all things become new. Gee, that quotes from a Bible, doesn't it? It's like everything changes, regeneration, new life. And the journey from that point on, there is this other paradox. The paradox on the one hand is, wow, I got Jesus and he got me. And on the other hand, the rest of my life, I'm trying to figure out how to get Jesus. It's like on the one hand, I know him, but on the other hand, I'm discovering him. And all I, I don't know, it, it, it's the paradox of the walk of the believer in Jesus, but the process of discovery and growth is, is part of the excitement. God, from, from glory to glory, one step at a time, is making us like him and fitting us for glory. And one day, he's going to present us before that throne faultless and without blame. And it's like, man, how are you going to pull this off? Because I'm a mess. You know, you say, I'm a mess before, and I feel like I'm still a mess in process. But So, so we, we, we just revel in all that, wonder in all of that. And, and we, we, we put it all together, and we see God's work in our lives, and there comes maybe points along the way where we say, man, God, you're too good because I'm a mess. I'm unfaithful, but you're always faithful. We sang about it earlier. Man, it's incredible that you hang in there with me. You love me unconditionally in spite of me, not because of me. And we just keep marching on and sometimes get relaunched, if you will, with freshness of, of new commitment to want to follow him and, and, and honor him. And so you, you come to the Romans 12 application of all this rich theology of, of salvation, sanctification, and, and we, we can begin academically to get a little bit of the fact that when I start to grasp all this in its fullness, I'm saying, Lord, just take me. Man, just, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm yours. Because when, when I'm mine, I make a mess of things. When I'm yours, you clean it up. So I'm just yours. I give you, give you my life. We can get that, right? Can we grasp that? 
If you're a believer in Jesus, every one of us should be able to grasp that. If not, maybe you need to recheck and ask yourself, am I really a follower of Jesus? Have I come to him? Do I know new life? Because every believer should be able to understand, at least in some sense, man, I give you my life because you gave me yours. And we get the fact that as this 12th chapter that we've gone through unfolds, big picture, relationships change. I look at them through a very different lens. I was incapable of seeing relationships before the way I am now enabled by God to see relationships now. Relationships can be different, need to be different. It's part of the transformational process. And it struck me that as God lays this last five chapter section of Romans out, that the sequence of relationship groups that he raises that go through a transformation process go from easier to harder. Because he started out with how relationships between this new family get changed. Remember, we we went through Romans 12, verses 3 through 16. This is a whole new group that we get connected to, that God connects us to. It's the one another stuff. It's fellow believers in Jesus that we partner with. We become part of the, the church, the called out ones. We become part of a group that we would have had no interest in connecting with before. None whatsoever except maybe if I wanted to do my religious thing and think if I was doing my religious duty, God might be happy with me, so I'll hang out with them as little as possible, at least to kind of meet the minimum requirements, right? Just kind of showing up. And But but now it's a different thinking, right? I'm getting Jesus, I'm getting what he's made me, and and so the importance of the togethering, the, the koinonia, the fellowship, the partnership, the worshiping together, connecting together, lives together, we start to get that. The the importance of building those relationships where I'm putting my brothers and sisters before myself and and all the stuff that that is here that seems to it at first, it kind of makes sense. The Romans 12, 10 stuff, I'm devoted to to one another, uh, giving preference to one another, and I'm diligent, I want to serve the Lord in it in verse 11. But here come these little hints of what's to come. It's almost like God's setting the stage for where he's going in relationship changes. There are these little nuggets in that initial paragraph that start to suggest something that we discover experientially in being part of a church family, of fellow believers in Jesus. And that discovery is none of us are perfect yet. Shocking. And we, 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 we look at other believers in Jesus that we, we start to get to know because we're getting to know them more just by virtue of the one anothering that takes place. And then we start to look at somebody else and we say, you know, your life really is messed up. <laughs> but I'm glad we're part of a family. Because so is mine. And then they're looking at you and saying, your life's pretty messed up. It's, it's like we realize, you know, we're all broken people that God's in the process of restoring and healing and, and renewing. And, and it's all that God's doing. But the more we get to know each other, the little hint here in Romans 12 is it's, it's not like it's, it's candy land. This isn't, this isn't Disney World stuff. This isn't like everything's easy. And you get these little nuggets like in Romans 12, 12, you know, we've we got to be rejoicing in hope because not everybody's got hope. And we've we got to hang in there in the hard times, tribulation. It ain't all easy. It's not like life's in, in, in Disney World because we're saved and we're in the family of God. Everything's perfect in everybody's lives. Man, there's difficulties that forces us to pray. The end of verse 12, we really got God help us. It ain't as good as I thought it was going to be. It's, it's tougher than I, than I expected. And you got verse 13. We're contributing to the needs. People have needs. They're still broken. God doesn't take all the consequences of our fallenness and sinfulness away because we come to Jesus. There's still a lot of stuff 
That's there. And it's not all perfect, is it? And you get that, that verse 14. Wow, is that an arrow in the middle of this thing blowing, blowing, this, blowing up the, this false perception? Among the family of believers, there are going to be some who are going to really mistreat me. Get nasty. <gasps> you get conflicts between believers and you get anger and hostility and people walk away, don't talk to each other. So you get these, this inference and suggestion that even in the closest of family groups, believers in Jesus, where we have all this commonality, it ain't all a bed of roses. I remember the first church where I served. Uh, we had the senior pastor's office and my office and the, the secretary's office. We had three offices. And at some point along the journey, somebody put these, this poster up on all three of our offices. I never knew who it was. Never found out. I asked, where did this come from? I, it was just up, I thought it was up on mine. I looked, it's up on all three of the, of the offices. And it had this, this poster of, of a bed of roses. And not, a lot of the roses were like dying. And the caption was, life is not a bed of roses. And I thought, you know, I, I had recently joined the pastoral staff officially I was kind of like part-time there for a while, and now I, I was officially there, and I thought, are they telling me something? <laughs> and what did I do now? Too, too early to mess up this badly. And I thought, you know, that's, but that's true, isn't it? And, and, and even in the closest of families where you have all this commonality, it's not all perfect. It's kind of sewed in here. And that expands. Suddenly what's, these little hints become a little larger in verses 17 to 21 because then the shift goes. Relationships with non-believers in Jesus who know what we believe and where we're at now, but they're in a totally different world, different worldview, different thinking. Of course, they're where we were before. And, and, and they, they, they don't like this spiritual stuff. And they don't like this Jesus stuff. They sure don't like what's happened to us. And you get all these conflicts that come. And you got verses 17 to 21, which really intensifies the challenge. It's tough enough when we know each other. But now you got those verses that deal with a culture of opposition. Where all of our impulse instincts is... You messed up me or my family. I'm going to get even. And you have those never statements, right? Verse 17, never pay back evil to evil. Respect what's right in the sight of all men, dead wrong, but they don't get it. They can't get it. Never, verse 19, take your own revenge. Verse 21, never become, uh, never become over, never be overcome by, by evil. In the preceding verse, Enemies hungry, feed him. Thirsty, give him a drink. The principle laid out here is recognizing we're living in a broken world with broken people, with broken lives who are desperately in need. And if we're discovering that among believers in Jesus who have been forgiven and we're, we're realizing believers are still broken, struggling with issues... Well, what do we expect from a lost culture around us? If, if we're still struggling and if we still have issues and we bring baggage and we have consequences of our past, the relationship stuff, what in the world are we thinking we're going to get from out there? The more we're becoming like Jesus, the further we are drawing, being drawn from, from the way that our culture thinks, what it believes, the way it acts what its priorities are. We're further removed than ever, which creates more conflict and difficulties. So it strikes me that every place God's going in this portion and saying, you're different now, you're changed now, your life's changed, relationships really are changed. And in fact, they're going to get tougher. A whole lot tougher. 
because of the intimacy that's required within the family, it comes with some tough spots. Because of the, the, the transformation that God's producing in you and me, I'm being drawn further and further away from this world and, and to a radically different way of thinking. It's going to come with some baggage and problems. Strikes me that when you get to the 13th chapter, this becomes the ultimate challenge of existing in a cursed, fallen environment and culture and world. Because if dealing with believers can come with struggles... Dealing with unbelievers comes huge struggles. Now you add to that a culture where authority, which begins from its fallenness, its spiritual lostness, and now I'm in the midst of an authority structure over me that is cursed by the same depravity. Now how do I function? How do I maintain a vision, a focus, an understanding big picture and my place in the middle of it? That's what Romans 13 is really all about. Dealing with a ruling agency of authority that may well be ungodly, utterly immoral, and a reflection of total fallenness. And, and here, here the, the challenge for us, let every person, verse 1 of chapter 13, be in subjection to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, emitting from the throne, and those that do exist are established there by God. Thankfully, when you come to Romans 13, verse 1, at least we begin with some biblical history. It's not like this comes out of the blue. We've got all of the experience of the people of Israel from the beginning. And we understand what it was like living underneath, they did, underneath oppression in in Egypt. And, And we understand the challenge of God as they traveled through the land of Canaan and were dealing with these utterly vile, godless cultures, all of the ites that existed in the land, the perversion of the ites. We get, we get some of that and, and we get the struggles in Israel's history of, of those who were raised up, who messed up, and those who were raised up who, who kind of at least by model, were, were men of integrity as kings. Interesting, when you look at the overview, you're doing it in the Old Testament survey class. You yeah, men, you look at the overview of Israel's kings and Judah's kings. It was like a nasty roller coaster ride. You had one, one, one guy who seemed to you know, really have a heart for God and, and, and wanted to bless the, the people. It's ironic that even the godliest of kings had little or shall we say, minimal impact upon the culture as a whole. They were so perverted by their history of identifying with the ites on the small level that they were were lost in their their sensualities, in their materialism, in in their selfish living, in their paganism. The culture possess them more than the influence from, from the king. So even the, even the best of them, the, the, the Uzziahs and the Hezekiahs, you know, they didn't, they didn't carry over. I'm, I'm impressed with that as I'm going through this preparation for the fall and the prophecies of Isaiah and getting reconnected with the period and the people and what life was like. Man, even the godly models, I wonder how frustrated they were. Great prophets, great kings and leaders, and the people were just still pagans. Just lost. Just nowhere. And then you you follow them with these wretched sons. What a a statement that is. What followed. The worst of the worst. And they just perpetuated lostness. And it took 
It would take multiple generations to change it. But this whole concept of, of, of rule and, and authority over God's people, that was nothing of what God intended. But the message always was, God raised them up. And when it was time, God put them down. Even allowing ungodly kings over Judah to pervert the temple and the city. It's like you and I would expect, what'd you do, take a a nap for 50 years? Where are you, God? Hello? How can you let this happen? This perversion. Israel kind of had this experience. It didn't change with the captivities. Man, when Sennacherib and the Assyrians blew out the northern kingdom, some of us who are maybe Old Testament students of Old Testament history might say, Israel and the north, they deserved it. Because they were like the pagans of the pagans of the pagans. They were more pagans than the pagans were. So that God punished them. Good. They went down. But you, you, then you look at Judah and you say, well, there, at least there's, there's some who are godly and some who are righteous and some who are faithful. And, and here you've got the Assyrians under Sennacherib. They're wiping out the whole south. They're making a mockery of Jerusalem. Well, God took care of them, didn't he? We'll study that one in Isaiah. It's like Isaiah is a newspaper reporter in four chapters in 36 to 39, given a, a day-to-day account of what happened and, and how God, multiple miracles and sparing Judah and, you know, Snacherib's gone, the sons kill him. Boy, he learned, he learned his lesson, go back home. And, and you know, the Assyrians, 185,000 of their soldiers surrounding Jerusalem are wiped out in the night. And it's like, yay, God, yay, God, cheerleader, go get him. Yeah, that didn't happen for long, did it? They ultimately went down. Why'd you let this happen? You're playing games with us? One moment you're sparing us, the next moment you're allowing this to happen. The, the struggle we have of the sovereignty of God, the providence of God in Old Testament history gives us a setup to understanding Romans. And you get Nebuchadnezzar and you get the Babylonians overrunning the whole thing and 70 years of captivity and then coming back and all of Israel's history sets this up. And now you get the time frame in which Paul the Apostle is writing this epistle coming to 13, chapter 13. This is to the large church, perhaps the largest Bible-believing church in the world by this period may well have been in Rome, possibly Jerusalem and the the churches surrounding may be rival, but nothing bigger than Rome. And it's in the capital of the empire. Man, you talk about a threat to emperor rule. Here was a huge church and influential and gospel teaching, preaching, and Paul's laying out this theology. And you can bet your bottom dollar in that church, there were multitudes of followers of Jesus who were saying, this emperor needs to go. Do him in. Need to overthrow this thing. Need to wipe it out. Blow this thing up. You think Romans 13 went down with many of them? This was, this was perspective. They were so caught up in the immediate. They were so caught up in the trees, they couldn't see the forest. Which is what Romans 13 is all about. It's an aerial ride. It's a look from above. It's big picture. Providence of God, sovereignty of God, purpose of God, divine mission identified. Who are we in this culture? That's what he was asking, challenging then. What's our mission? How do we make, how do we become a blessing? How do we become a servant of God? We sang it. How do we do it when there's so much injustice and so much unrighteousness and so much self-promotion? How do we do it in a system that looks so corrupt and so vile? What's our purpose and mission? It's everything that Romans 13 is all about. Now, now let me say, while we're living in an age, while we are surrounded by 
the same wide variety of governmental systems as there's always been. It hadn't changed. You, 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 got, you got plenty of kooks. Evil, wicked, self-rule, dictators. From Russia to China to North Korea to Venezuela to Cuba... Now a lot of the countries in Africa, you've got a pollution of evil. Well, what do we expect? I mean, that makes perfect biblical sense when you think through a biblical lens. Because you have depravity and wickedness and sinfulness. And then you have people who gain, through whatever means, self-wealth and power and prestige and prosperity and control over masses of people who they couldn't give a hoot about except that they are instruments through which I gain more power, more control, more wealth. But we, we expect that to be different. Biblical thinking. If you and I have to struggle with a heart that's de- deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, if you and I struggle with our own sinful flesh, don't you think it would be greater? Having all of those enticements To live my life focused on me, myself, and I, all about me? It's easy to see how they go that route. Makes perfect sense to me. It is is somewhat of an irony. Not even irony. It's, It's kind of remarkable that in the end, everything the Bible teaches, we'll see it in our prophetic series, everything the scriptures teach from the Old Testament prophets, when the Messiah finally comes and fulfill the righteous longing of the Jews, Messiah comes and sets his feet upon the mount and establishes his throne forever and ever, it will be an unchallenged, unrivaled dictatorship. But built on absolute purity, absolute righteousness, absolute justice, absolute mercy, absolute grace, absolute love, it will be the ultimate dictatorship ultimate, that will ironically allow me to discover all of my God-designed freedoms. It won't be a restrictive rule. It will be a liberating rule. It's kind of an irony. Every governmental system is polluted by the sinfulness of human flesh. And and while in our culture I see more and more of evangelical leaders engaged in the battle and all the discussions about a a, a democratic system or a system that is a republic uh, and all the philosophical arguments about, about this system being the greatest system on the face of the earth, it is fraught with no less problems than a dictator driven by evil. None. Same issues. You get people with influence and power and wealth and control, they will pollute, contort, and distort. And so you've got governmental systems that have been ours for 200 years, and it's been fraught with all kinds of wretchedness. The system isn't divine. If God will allow in his providence evil to gain authority to accomplish his divine purpose... And we see the the evidence of all of that wickedness affecting the citizenry of those countries. It's no less of an issue here. It's the same thing when I hear the the debates and discussions about, about capitalism and the benefits of capitalism. There can be lots of benefits. But it's fraught with the exact same problems as any other any other system. Especially when we consider the sinfulness of of men. Capitalism consumed by greed, the lust for more, power, influence, control, money. You get those in a free market enterprise system who end up going over the line, who seize control, who gain greater wealth for themselves, who really don't care for the people who are under them except to use them to gain them greater wealth. Even within that system, because of the, 
the wretchedness and evil and depravity of the human heart, even there where people can be encouraged to maximize their abilities, rugged individualism, you know, pursue for themselves their own wealth, maximize their own gifts and talents, you know, earn and, and free, even that system will be polluted by the wretchedness and depravity of men. There is no system that works because we are sinful. Some may be better than others, but they're all going to be fraught. So all that comes down to, man, what, what's our place in all this? This past week, I didn't plan this. I didn't orchestrate this. But I, I was really amazed that Romans 13 suddenly became national headlines. If you follow it all, the news. It was quoted by our Attorney General. I'll go there because, one, he quoted it, and two, it's a great illustration I'm not making a commentary on on governmental rule systems, presidents, cabinets, and all that stuff. I'm going to comment on where he went and what he said. Because it's it's big, front and center. Uh, Did you follow it all? You've got to to look it up. It's big stuff. Attorney General standing in front, making a, a speech, justifying the enforcement of laws that affect what's happening on the borders and the, the, the separation of children from parents of those who come across the border illegally, and, and the enforcement of laws. I'm not getting into that debate. That's not the point of the whole thing at all. What I am struck with is what Attorney General Sessions did to give credence and support to the enforcement of what they believe the laws were. He quoted Romans 13, this, this passage that we read. And quite frankly, I was utterly infuriated, enraged. Did you get the point? It wasn't just a calm response. Oh, isn't that nice? Because he absolutely took Romans 13 out of its context. He's clueless. If he really believes that's what it meant, utterly clueless. He used Romans 13 to say, essentially that government has the authority and right to do whatever it wants to do to impose its laws on people. And his quote is, even the Apostle Paul in Romans 13 said the same. In other words, the statement is, whatever is legal is moral. Whatever is legal is right. And I say, never, never, never. Was that loud enough? I don't know if it was loud enough. I don't, I, don't know if, I, I don't know if I'm speaking with any clarity here. I just have a hard, hard time understanding if I'm communicating. I have one built in. What's that? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not really making clear how I really feel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that is utterly frightening because, frankly, that's the same kind of nonsense... I might expect to hear from Maduro in Venezuela or Putin in Russia or Kim Jong-un in in North Korea. I might expect it to to hear that kind of garbage from despots, but from him? Holy mackerel, are you kidding me? Already done some things. That is utterly frightening. Romans 13 has nothing to do with an endorsement of the way a government rules. It has only to do with, one, the providence of God in allowing governments its place, and more importantly, the place of believers in Jesus living underneath that culture of rule. It's addressed to those who are subject to that government, not those who are exercising government rule. And Romans 13 has nothing to do with absolutes of every governmental system. So quickly going through this becomes important. The principle is profound. The principle of Romans chapter 13 and verse 1 is to understand the authority of God. We quoted it the last couple of weeks. Lots of passages. Not going to go through it. Go listen to the 
to the audios again. God's absolute providential authority over all governmental systems of all time allowing. Even when there is evil, he exercises dominion and authority. He raises up, he takes down. Just that for us, he doesn't do it as quickly as we'd like. But let me, let me challenge you to think for a second. If you're going to apply that principle to governments and you're going to arbitrarily decide when a government oversteps its boundaries and when God should judge and condemn them, why don't you do this? Look in the mirror. I dare you. Look in the mirror. Do you want God to establish the same standard for judging you? Because I don't want to go there. Not a chance. The same mercy, the same long-suffering, the same patience, the same endurance that God displays with us, the same reason why you and I aren't removed like dust long ago applies not just to us as individuals or to the lost in their rebellion. I am so thankful that God didn't burn me up and throw me away when I was lost for all of the ways that I demonstrated I was repulsed by God and never knew it. I'm so thankful God didn't look at me and say, you're a hopeless wretch. Gone, 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 gone. Huh? I'm so thankful in my own journey with the Lord so many times in my failure, in my impulsiveness, in my sinfulness, in my selfishness, in my, in my reactions. I'm so thankful that God didn't look at me and say, you're a hopeless wretch. Gone. You know, so so we, we, we become pretty selective. You know, I, for me, mercy. For me, grace. For me, patience. For me, endurance. For me, long-suffering. Sure, I like that. But, but not, not up there. I don't want to go there anymore. <laughs> See, so, so here we are. Paul's going to validate based upon principles that, that they already knew. But he's going he's to lay it out in, in basic form these principles of, of why. why. Why is it that God would expect us to live in subjection to governing authorities? That, that starting place that we, we noted, the reign of government is God's rule and resistance to government is rebellion against God. That starting place from verse 1 and 2 is all about the big picture. God's sovereign. God's in control. He's always been in control. You can look back at Old Testament history and see God raising up Neb. And you can see why God was patient because the guy ends up getting saved apparently late, late and long in, in, in life. And God has providential purposes in, in equipping his people to be able to return. He sees what we don't see, knows what we don't know. Big picture, he's sovereign and exercises his dominion. But it's the, these last points, just to quickly note, they link together. We're not going to spend a lot of time on, on them to, just to see the package and the importance of each one, without looking at these as absolute statements of all governments. General principles. Purpose number three of why to be subject. Resistance to government is recompensed. Now, now look, at, look at chapter three from the middle, or chapter 13, rather, the middle of verse two. After he states the principle, if you resist the authority of God, you're opposing the ordinance of God since God established it. The second half of verse 2 of chapter 13, they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. We look at the word condemnation and we jump to a quick conclusion. God's going to judge me. We always associate the word condemnation with God condemning. Right? There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We, we, we associate that as being God's, God's response. This has nothing to do with God's response to us. This has to do with the consequences of me drawing the line in the sand and saying, I'm not going to obey the governing authorities over me for this particular reason, whatever that reason might be. The simple generic statement is, is this. If... You oppose the authority that God providentially allows over you. And you choose randomly where you're drawing the line in the sand because you believe 
your rulers are unjust, unfair, immoral, ungodly, unbiblical. And so you're going to say, I refuse to obey that command. We better be sure we're at the place of Peter in Acts chapter 4 and 5. We better be sure we're at the place of Daniel there in Babylon, all of whom were drawing lines of saying, you know, this, this isn't the mission God's given to me. But this is. Where do you draw the line? Because if we determine that apart from my own personal walk and life in obeying Jesus, following Jesus, talking about Jesus, living for Jesus, if I determine I'm going to draw the line in the sand against my rulers or authorities over me for other issues, better understand the principle of verse, the end of verse 2 is you're going to bear the consequences. You may not like the law, you may not like the principle, you may not like the punishment that the government says it will impose upon you for violating it. You may not like it, and frankly, you may be right. It may be that they have gone beyond what God's allowed, but that's God's point in the end of chapter 12. It's his business to take revenge. It's his business to right wrong. It's my business to serve lost people in the place where God's put me. The point of the end of verse 2 is, there will be consequences, just understand it. They set the law, they say, you're going to jail because you didn't agree with whatever law they put on the books. And if they lay out, this is the consequence for what you're doing, don't be shocked if you're behind bars. And then you're going to raise up, that's ah, another injury. Just understand, you're going to bear consequence. Because God's given them that right, even though they may be utterly wrong. You're going to bear the consequence. It's interesting. Jesus made the same statement to Peter. Same statement. It's in um, Matthew chapter 26 and, and verse 52. Remember this moment when, um, when uh, the Roman cohort, the Roman soldiers came into the garden, betrayed Jesus betrayed by Judas. They're all there to arrest Jesus and they got all their armor and they got all their swords. And remember what Peter did? Takes a sword, cuts off Malchus's ear. Probably was going for his neck but missed. Um, and and, and he, there he, Peter, Peter was cool because he really learned over time. Love the guy. I feel like he's my buddy. Just like you. I'm a screw up, mess up over and over again but ultimately along the road, you know, sometimes the lights go on. He, he, he wrote about this later on. Matthew 26 and, and uh, verse 52, Jesus' response is really profound. He said, Peter, listen, get rid of your sword. We're, by the way, Peter, we're not taking on the army because like they're armed and we're not. Probably a dumb move. Probably not wise. But here's the principle. All those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. What did he say to Peter? Hey, Pete, Roman laws say they could now crucify you next week for what you just did. That's what their laws. You may not like it. You may think you were righteous defending me, but understand something. That's the law. You might bear the consequence of what you just did. It's remarkable. Jesus is giving us a very statement that ironically he followed in three plus years of ministry. Because he didn't yell, moan, and scream about all the injustices of Rome, which by the way, their injustices against the citizenry of their empire were a million times worse than anything you'll cite in this country. Anything. And on top of that, what many of our brothers and sisters endure in most of the rest of the world are a million times worse than anything we deal with here, even though we're headed in their directions. Principles there. Just understand, if that's where you draw the line in the sand, there's going to be consequences, going to pay a price. That's what they're there for. They may not do it right. They may not do it morally. They may not do it biblically. But it's laid out. Just, just, get, just get the picture. What are you going to suffer for? Our friend Pastor Brunson made it clear where the line was in the sand. 
He wouldn't compromise his witness for Jesus. He went back putting himself in jeopardy to preach Jesus in a country that he always knew where it was permitted to minister to believers. So he drew the line in the sand there. Peter drew the line in the sand. You have a right to make all your laws, whatever they are. They may be wrong. They may be immoral. They may be unjust. They may be impure. They may be counter to what God's allowed. But you guys do your thing. You write your laws. That's cool. But you better understand something. When it comes to my mission, my calling before God, I'm going to obey God rather than than men. But it was a clear focus on mission. It's what Jesus was about. It's what Daniel was about. It's what the prophets in the Old Covenant were about. It's what Peter was about. Resistance to government, it's going to be recompensed. Make sure the the line's drawn right. And, and, And the rest of them just follow. Beginning, oh, by the way, <laughs> interesting. Um, well, 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 we'll get to this here. The beginning, the beginning of, of verse 3, the role of government is to restrain. We, we, we really struggle with this increasingly. Rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. General principle. Because of their pollution, they all, they all get it wrong to one degree or another. But the general divine purpose of God in in ordaining and establishing governmental systems is to have some check on cultural chaos. Now, a lot of the government's really screwed up by autocratic control. And and I remember when I was in the jungles of Venezuela, each, each, each little cultural group each little people group had its own system of, of rule. It's fascinating to why, watch how they, how they constructed themselves. By the way, it's an argument for the existence of God to recognize that isolated cultures that have no connection with each other all have some understanding that there is basically what's right and basically what's wrong, and they form their cultures based upon their understanding of moral code. It's fascinating. They don't have to be told. They didn't need a book. They didn't have to become spiritual. It's just built in. We are designed because we're created after the image of God, even polluted by our sinfulness. There is a basic understanding that human beings, even though depraved and screwed up, think, well, there are certain things that are right, certain things that are wrong. And so they, they formulate their, their cultures based upon that understanding. I, I remember being in, in one tribe that had an interesting way of, of promoting family integrity and unity. And so... If in one particular family, um, a particular man basically stole someone else's wife, and, and they, there would be some cases where a guy might end up with two or three wives by, by stealing someone else's wife, and, and maybe the wife thought she'd be better off as one of three with this guy than she thought she was one-on-one with this guy. And, and so this kind of stuff went on. And they, had, they built their own laws, their own rules. And their rule was, if you steal somebody else's wife, you're going to have to pay that guy back with some of your possessions. And they had codes down for how many animals you would have to give them or how much of your land. Shock. You'd have to give them how much of your garden they would... T- it's fast. But what the point is, you know, you look at some of these things, you can laugh at some of their laws, some of their rules. But the amazing thing is they all had them. Polluted, distorted, contorted, godless, they had them. All governments have them. Many of them are for self-elevating purposes. But as a general overall principle, what God's saying is, listen, there is absolute unrivaled chaos apart from even fallen men exercising authority culturally, locally, linguistically, geographically over the lives of its people. It is a divinely appointed purpose. And it's always going to be screwed up because of sinfulness. Paul understood that, right? How many times did Paul find himself in a place where he was, on one case, almost killed by, by unbelievers outside of Derby and Asia Minor? He's almost killed. And nothing happened to the guys who attempted to kill him. They stoned him and left him for dead outside the street, didn't realize he was still alive. They didn't get punished. 
because they were exercising what they believed was their righteous responsibility. The local Roman governing authority said, you guys clean this mess up. We don't want to touch this. Paul didn't call upon Roman soldiers to get even. He's a Roman citizen. He had every right to defend himself. Didn't do that. Isn't that bizarre? In Philippi, when he's beaten almost dead in stocks with Silas, there they are in chains in a, in a stone prison underground. Every reason to call in Roman authorities to free him because as a Roman citizen, there was nothing he did that violated Roman law. And here he is almost dead, bleeding, battered, exposure of, of bones. I mean, he, he was as near dead as you can get. What is he doing? I want to see my Roman lawyer now. What's he doing? What are they doing? Lord, you're, providentially, you're in dominion. You're in control. You want authority. You've got a purpose here. I'm not saying. But, but it's your control. They're screwed up. They're messed up. Their laws, their imposement. It's wrong. It's immoral. It's unjust. But I believe in the sovereignty of God. You've allowed this for a purpose. Did he know what was coming? No. Earthquake comes. Get free. Of all people, get saved. It's a jailer that's holding him and his whole family. How are you going to pull this one off? Jesus faced it, didn't he? Talk about injustice. Every trial he went through from the priest to the Romans was illegal, unjust, immoral, and violated law. No, no appeal. None. Because he understood why he came. He understood what his mission was. Paul understood what his purpose and mission was. It's their role, even screwed up. Hmm. Purpose number five, the role of government is to reward. This is going to get just as messed up. End of verse three, beginning of verse four. You want to have no fear, do what's good. That is good in, in, in their eyes. They'll recognize you. Verse, beginning of verse 4, they are ministers of God, not in the sense of preachers of truth. They are, they are serving God when they establish some sentiment of order. These are rules. These are laws. This is right. This is wrong. This is punishable. Everybody gets it. This is the, this is the consequence. They are doing God's purposes by establishing that. Now, you and I may not agree with it, may not buy into it, but we've got to see the big picture. Daniel got the big picture. Here's the change, Peter. This is the different Peter. First uh, Peter chapter 2, we, we quoted this, I believe, minimally last week. First Peter chapter 2 and uh, verses, verses 12 and, and 13. This is a Peter who's getting the big picture. First Peter chapter 2 verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the unbelievers, that is excellent in their eyes, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. He's just vindicating what Paul did hanging in a prison cell in Philippi and what the other disciples were, were doing in, in responding to the injustices that surround, surround them. The, the godly behavior, even submitting to godless authority, is used by God to build a bridge to share the gospel of redemption. It's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. It's ironic that verse 12 couples with the next paragraph, submit yourselves to the Lord's sake, to every human institution. There it is. Why? Because you see, we got a bigger mission. we got a bigger calling, bigger purpose. It's not to fight those battles. It's to trust those to the providence of God and to see lost people that God's called us to, to reach. The end of verse 4, the role of government is in its state to enact punishment and, and revenge. It's not ours to do, it's, it's his. And so it, it notes... If you do what's evil, be afraid. It does not bear the sword for nothing. By the way, that's a statement of capital punishment. Interesting statement. You can make an argument in verse 4. It is a minister of God. Second time that statement's used. Implication is capital punishment under certain occasions 
is God's provision for the sacredness of life. That's Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. It is because of the sacredness of human life. Now, once again, polluted governments, godless governments wrongly enforce it. People sometimes suffer consequences for something they're not guilty of or not worthy of that kind of punishment for. Remember those two thieves surrounding Jesus? I mean, they were, they were that. They were thieves. For whatever reason, Romans said, what you did was against us, not against people, so you're dead. So Jesus displayed some grace and mercy, and you get salvation on a, on a death sentence. But the whole issue of, of punishment for breaking laws is part of God's design for keeping cultures in some semblance of order, even in fallenness, it's even there, our places to find our role, concluding in that last point in verse 5. Wherefore, it's necessary to be in subjection, not only because we might endure the wrath or punishment, but also for conscience sake. Now, these followers of Jesus were willing to endure the death sentence for preaching Jesus. Most of them face that. But they all seem to want to be certain that the reason why they would be punished by government was for the reason that matched their calling, their purpose, their design. And so you've got this, we, we quit here, the statement of Peter. This is the more mature understanding, Peter, on this principle First Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 13, we'll read this, we'll, we'll close. He asked this rhetorical question. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? That's an interesting statement. If you're doing God's mission, God's calling, God's purpose, proclaiming the truth of the gospel to lost people, There's not going to be any harm to come to you, even if they sentence you. And all these guys went through it. Because in the end, you get the death sentence, there's a reward. It's win-win. Verse 14, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. That's a takeoff on Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Don't fear their intimidation. Don't be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to to make a defense to everyone who asks to give you an account for the hope that's in you with gentleness and reverence. There's your purpose. There's your calling. It's not to change government. It's to bring the message that transforms hearts and lives. We have one purpose. It's not political. It's transformational. And so he challenges us, verse 16, keep keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. It's better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. I don't know if this complicates it or makes it a little clearer, but it's all about mission focus. It, it's, how, it's how I view relationships that change. I'm part of the family of God. Relationships with each other have issues. Thankfully, we have some foundations to build from to, to make them right. Lost people, we got issues. Expect it, understand it. What am I going to get angry at? What am I going to react at? What am I going to seek payment for? Do I really want to go there? Or do I want to be overcoming unrighteousness with what is righteous? Do, do I want to see the, the, the big picture mission of reaching lost people in a fallen culture? And what's true of a fallen culture is true of a fallen society and governmental systems. My mission isn't changing the government. My mission isn't changing that culture my mission is God planted me here in the sovereignty of God and the providence of God. And if we think it's bad here, we can't stand anywhere next to our brothers and sisters in most of the world. Our mission is gospel focused, life transitional. Lord, help us to see what we're calling is. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to see what our calling is. 
what our purpose is, what our mission is. Hearts deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? You've called us to be salt and light to a fallen world of which once we were a part of, a participant in, a promoter of. Lord God, help us to see with clarity the privilege we have of declaring the unsearchable riches of Jesus to be a blessing, to be a servant, to speak and preach Jesus. If they will attack us, let it be for what counts. Thank you for your patience with us. We don't know why you endure all the hostilities that surround us, but we thank you that you endure it with us. And Lord God, use us in this age, in this day, for this purpose, for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen.